Okay, so we are going to look at transforming functions today. We need to understand how to transform functions. We need to describe the transformations of a function. And uh, we're also going to look at odd and even functions. Okay, so first up, describe how to, trans uh, describe how to transform f of x equals x squared to obtain the graph related in the, uh, the graph of g of x. So if we're told that g of x is equal to minus 3 times f of x minus 2 minus 2, this is a transformation of the original graph. Discuss with the person next to you what transformations you see here. Okay, what do we have? What do we have? This minus two, what does that give us? This minus two, what does that give us? Come on. Our translation uh, to two units to uh, your right. So, horizontal so, translation to units. Translation to units right. So, next up, so. When it comes to the order that you apply these, it's the same as the order of precedence of operations that you would actually evaluate the function in. So our next one is minus three. What does this give us? A reflection over the x axis. We have a reflection in the x axis. What does the three give us? Uh, vertical stretch factor of three. Vertical stretch factor three. Okay, and then lastly, the minus four. What does that one give us? So, um, translation four is uh, tran uh, vertical translation. Well, vertical, let's say vertical translation. Units. Which direction? Down. Down. All right. So then we have to sketch it. So start off by sketching the vertex for a quadratic function. So that point there is going to go. Where is it going? It's going two to the right and four down. So two to the right, four down, and we're going to get that vertex here. We have a stretch and reflection. Well, that makes it easy to sketch, doesn't it? <laughs> so. We're going to go like this, and then we're going to get a stretch. Hmm. We're going to get a stretch, and we're going to get a reflection. So we are going to be down here, aren't we? I can't really draw much of it. I can't really calculate the stretch much. What does the F stand for after minus 3? The function. Function f. Oh, okay. So it's a transform. It's a transformation of this, which is our original function. Okay, that's it. We, we could calculate a bit more accurate, but we can't. We're not enough for our space. All right. Discuss with the person next to you. What are our transformations here? Uh, uh, yeah. Vertical compression. Vertical compression. No, no, no. 
Okay, so what do we what do we have first? What comes first? Is that? So I'm going to use shift this time. Shift five units left. Five units left. What about this one over two? What does that do? What's that one? I, I think it's a horizontal compression factor. Is it a horizontal compression? Is it? It is, it is horizontal. You're in the right direction. Is it is factor two. It is going to be stretched. So what helps you to remember is the what goes on inside the bracket always seems to be backwards. Like for instance, when we have plus five, it goes to the left instead of to the right. Um, so everything inside the bracket kind of help works backwards. So a half is a stretch by factor two. So often you, you see it written in the form of f of one over b like this, x uh, minus h. Meaning that b is the this sort of b is the actual stretch or compression. So because b is two. You could say that would be your stretch. That's one way to think of it. You can also think of it, it everything's just backwards when it's down in that. Right. So if it was just like the number, like if it, instead of half, it would just two, or how would you say Compression. Compression. Compression factor two. So it's just the number of compression, but it's a fraction. It's a fraction. If it's less than one, no, but if it's a fraction, remember, five over four is a fraction. But if it's uh, less than one, it's um, a stretch, and if it's more than one, it's a compression. No, it works the horizontal stretch. That only works for the horizontal. It's the other way around for the vertical one. Oh. That's why I don't get. Chapter number three. Sorry. Chapter number three. Uh, how do we know if uh, it's a vertical or It's vertical if it's outside the bracket. For both translations uh, and. Stretches and compression. Outside the bracket is vertical, inside is horizontal. That generalizes. All right, so you had a question, chapter number five. Do you think like, they're reciprocal? Is that horizontal? Uh, if you wish, yeah. Um, so what we have, we got a, was it a compression or a stretch? I can't remember now. It's a stretch. Let's write horizontal first. Horizontal. Stretch horizontal stretch, which direction? The sugar sticking in factor horizontal stretch factor <coughs> two. Okay, and then we what else do we have? Vertical shift, vertical shift, shift. up. Two units. Okay, so where is our vertex going to be now? It's going to be at minus five comma two. So we can't barely get that one at minus five comma two. So our vertex. Um, hmm. So normally I wouldn't. When you're doing 
translations of absolute functions and reciprocal functions, rational functions, quadratic functions. There's no point having horizontal compression in the stretch. It's a stupid thing to do. Because it's the same as vertical. Watch this. So we have a half x plus 5 squared plus 2. This is our function, isn't it? We put in the f of x. This is equal to 1 over 4 x plus 5 squared plus 2. So horizontal stretch and vertical compression are going to look the same. They're going to look the same. So a vertical, so this is, the, these are both the same functions. So we can do this by converting it to a vertical stretch factor two. So this is going to be down here at a quarter. And that's the same as a horizontal stretch. So if we would go with this point here, which is at four, is going to come down to one here like this one. And if you notice now, we're stretching horizontally by two. It's going to look like this. So the, the parent function goes through 2 comma 4. That one would be compressed down to 2 comma 1. The parent function goes through 1 comma 1. That would be horizontally stretched by 2. You don't see the difference in the two. They look identical. Uh, so a lot of functions, a horizontal stretch and a vertical uh, compression, create the same result. Although, depending on the function, because this is a squared function, then the relationship between the two uh, factors of how much it is is squared. So this is a half, and this is a half squared, it's a quarter. So we're compressing by a factor of four. We're stretching by a factor of two. And that's because the relationship between these two is squared. That's not going to be the same for all functions, but it would be for, uh, depending on what the function is, obviously, when you work with a rational function, uh, or a reciprocal function particularly, it's just going to be the reciprocal of it. When you work with the uh, absolute function, it's going to be the absolute of it. It depends what the function does as you move it out. So. so there's that. All right. Have a go at this one for yourself. Describe the function. Have a go at sketching it. Have a go at sketching it. Describe the trans transformations and sketch. Without more information, I can't completely <coughs> make critical. I was going to ask, like, how can I get a new 
Did you bring me cookies? Thank you. Did you bring her? Thank you. Did you say I'll serve you? Thank you. You have to be home based. Okay. Can we focus on the man? Yeah. Yeah, I'll see that. Right. So, what transformations do we have? What's the first transformation? Horizontal stretch by 502. Okay, so horizontal, horizontal stretch, factor 2. What else do we have? Vertical stretch by 502. Vertical stretch, factor 2. And then. Did it cancel each other out? No. Okay, and then we have a, a, sorry, a vertical shift down. Vertical shift down. It's a good idea. Good question, though. Vertical shift <coughs> down. Now, on a quadratic function, absolute function, reciprocal function, they're going to cancel each other out. They are going to cancel each other out. Let's, uh, let's take f of x is equal to 1 over x, and let's take g of x equals 2 f of uh, 2x. So we have two, um, we have what we have a horizontal compression factor two. We have a vertical stretch factor two. These will cancel each other out. This is going to give us two times one over two x, which is two over two x, which is one over x. These two are going to cancel each other out, but not these two. So it depends on the type of function. Some functions, uh, the horizontal compression, it tends to do with symmetry. It tends to do with the symmetrical nature of the function, uh, whether it's going to cancel each other out on. So on this one, we need to do the, we need to move some bits and pieces around. So what have we got? We've got a horizontal stretch factor two. That's easy. So these maximums are going to move up by two. They're going to double in height. They're going to double the right. Two at the moment, they're going to double by two. Sorry. Vertical stretch factor two. We've got a horizontal stretch factor two. So this point here is going to move to there. At the moment, it's a pi. It's going to be a two pi. This one's a two pi. It's going to go to four pi. So I'm going to start off by doing the x-intercepts. These two x-intercepts. This one's going to go be doubled. This one's going to be doubled. So they're going to move like that. This one here is going to be doubled to there. So this one moves to there. This one moves to there, and that one moves all the way over there. So let me plot everything without the vertical. Oh, I'll do the vertical shift down as well. So this point's going to go up here. It's going to go across to here, and then it's going to get shifted down to there. So this point here. This point here is going to go there. It's going to get stretched up. It's going to get stretched in that direction, and then it's going to get moved down. So this point here is at uh, this point here is at one, two, uh, three, five, or two. It's going to get double, so it's going to be over at six, five, or two, or three, five. This point's going to move over to here. It's going to get stretched down to here and then shifted down to there. This point's going to be here. This point gets doubled, moved over to here, and then shifted down one, so the x-intercept is there. We've got this sort of principal axis of this function, which is here. I'll put that in to help us. This is the line y equals minus 1. So then our function is going to look like this. Gonna look like this. 
Let me just do this last one. That one is going to move to here. This one's going to move to there. It's going to be parallel to that one. It's going to look like this. Let me clean that up a little bit. point here, the x value has been doubled. This point here, the x value, the y value has been doubled and then subtracted by 1. And we end up here. This point here, the x value has been doubled. The y value has been doubled, but 0, you don't double 0. And then it's been moved down by 1. This point here, it's been doubled. So it comes to minus 2. The x value has been doubled, so it goes over here and it moves down by 1. So picking all the different points, you've got to double the x value with the compression, with a stretch, with a horizontal stretch. You've got to double the y value, vertical, and then you're going to move it down by 1 with your shift. Any questions? Um, the x translations always happen after the stretches, right? No, typically the, um, the, it goes in order of precedence of operations. So depending, if you look at how it's been built, usually there's a bracket around the x minus h, sort of inside the bracket, and that one goes first. Then you get your, your horizontal compressions, then you get your vertical, your vertical stretches and compressions, then you get your vertical translation. That one comes last. As if you like, if you move it like up or yeah, you change, you change the effect. Yes. But it's order of precedence of operations that's causing it all. And you can see it there in that one. We don't go into it in that much detail here on this course, uh, so I'm stretching you here with this question. Um, this is the hard one that took today. Um, you get it more in next year if you do the higher level course. I did. Let's say you want to practice that for yourself. Let's say you want to practice that and train at this skill. This is important. We'll come back to this later when we do trigonometric functions. You can always practice this yourself quite easily. Give yourself a function. Y equals sine x. Decide what your transformation is. Uh, y equals 2 times, close your eyes as you, don't look at the graph as you do it, y equals 2 times f of x minus, minus, I was going to go for 3.14, for this bracket, uh, minus 5. So, Put your function in, don't look at it, switch it off, have a go at sketch, screenshot it, have a go at sketching it, and then check your answer if you're right or not. So you can do it like this. And if you want to practice this, this is a harder one. We do more of this uh, when we do trigonometric functions. I picked this function here for today because the horizontal compression and stretch and the vertical stretch and compression are not related in this particular. You do them separately. But a lot of the other functions we've seen, they cancel each other out. Yeah, sure. This is the important part of the lecture. I'll go faster. So, yeah. There is. Okay. Discuss with the person next year. Have a go at sketching the um, transformation for G of X. Figure out. Or you like to put it in 
Okay. What do we think it does? First thing, let me ask a question. If that minus sign was outside the um, outside of the f, if it was minus f of x, what would it do then? Isa. Vertical No. Sorry, let me say Hannah. Hannah. We're doing a reflection on the x-axis. If it's inside, what do you think it does? Reflection on the y-axis. Now, however, when we reflect in the y-axis, what are we reflecting in the y-axis? We're reflecting everything in the first and fourth quadrant in the y-axis. This bit will disappear. Basically, it's easy. When you put 1 into the function, the answer is 0. When we put minus 1, so when we put 1 into this function, All right, no, sorry, I'm getting slightly wrong. It's just going to create a reflection in the y axis. In the, in the y -axis. When we put 1 into this function, it will evaluate it as though it was minus 1, giving this value around about here, 2.2-ish. When we put minus 1 into the function, here, it will evaluate it as though it was 1. It's just going to flip everything. It's just going to flip everything. So we take this point and put it over here. We take this point. Um, and we put it here-ish, we take this point and we move it back here to minus 2 comma 2 minus 4 comma 3, uh, here. We add the horizontal asymptote, we've got a horizontal asymptote going in this direction over there. That'll be enough for us to hit, right. have I moved all the points? So I'm coming from here, and we need to put, move this one, 2.8 to here. Let's see if we can sketch that. So we are starting, we, we're starting up here like this. We come down like that. We hit this point there. And we go up to here. It's going to go through the same point there at that point. It's going to hit that point, and then it's going to come down. Down and approach our acid so reflection in the y axis. This becomes minus one, comma zero. I'm just reflecting the x values, the y values don't change. So this point becomes 0 0.8 comma 2.3. Um, this point, I've done that one, done that one. This point over here becomes minus 2.2 comma minus 4.3. This x-intercept is at minus 2.8 comma 0. The horizontal asymptote is at y is equal to 2. You can see it approaching that asymptote there like this. Yeah. Like this. What functions look like this? This is a um, this is basically a exponential function. So from this point to infinity, from minus 3 to negative infinity, 
from this point here around about 2.5 up to infinity, it's going to look like a, an exponential function. The end behavior is completely derived by the exponential function. It's much more powerful than the... Uh, I've added a cubic function to this one here in the middle. So this bit in the middle is a cubic function with a sort of wiggle like that, a sort of S type wiggle. Safe, don't fall asleep. Um, so what happens when you mix like a polynomial function and an exponential function? Around zero, it will act like a polynomial function. Outside, towards the end, it will act like the exponential function, because that one takes over and has more power. Uh, so you can see it. Let me just sketch the two for you. We take... Uh, oh, I don't have my glasses. We want e to the x. Great. E to the x. We want this one to be y equals. I think I use something like this. And I think I added up something like that in it. This is how the polynomial looks. This is how the exponential looks. If I combine the two functions together, if we zoom out, you see in this direction it's looking like the exponential function, and in this direction it's looking like the exponential function as well. So, zooming out basically looks like an exponential function. Anyway, move on from that. Odd and even functions. So, an odd function, when a parameter in a stretch or compression is negative, another transformation called a reflection is introduced. Examining reflection will also tell us whether a function is even or odd function. An even function is one where f of minus x is equal to f of x. This one will create, so even function, see our definition here, an even function will create a reflection in the uh, x-axis. An odd function will create a um, rotation in the point of the origin. So this one here is going to be odd. This one here is going to be even. This one's going to be even. Show that this is an odd function. So, what do we need to show? What do we need to show? Use these two definitions up here. Show that f of minus x is equal to f of x. To show that it's odd or even algebraically. Oh, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. 
We need to show that. So with a show that question like this one, which is suitable for a, a semester exam, you need to decide whether it's going to be told whether it's even or odd. Put the right definition. No, I, I was right. Well, it's odd, oh, thanks. I'm, I'm going to prove that it's even. Thank you. You are right. So we have to show that it's odd. We find the correct definition. And then we say left hand side needs to equal f of minus x. So we can insert that into the function. Like this. And we're going to manipulate this a little bit. So you see the minuses in the exponents. What does that do? What does the minus sign in the exponent do? Wait, not shout out. What does the minus sign in the exponent do? Looking for somebody new. Mark. It's a fraction with the denominator. It's be more specific. It's a uh, like the reciprocal of the, the base number with to the power of the. You're missing some words for this, aren't you? <laughs> I think, I think, do we think he's saying the correct thing? It sounds about right. Let me hear another, have another go at it. Uh, Melis? This one becomes 1 over 2x, so 2 to the x. This one does that. This one does that. It basically moves it, it switches its place from the denominator to the numerator or from the numerator to the takes that term and moves it from the denominator into the denominator, or it's in the denominator and moves it into the numerator. So one, two, out of the two, Oh, I don't, I'm sorry. I didn't see the equal side. So what I can do now is I'll take this expression and I'll factor out a minus one. If I factor out a minus one, this term becomes positive, this term becomes negative, I'll switch their places, which is minus f of x, which is the right hand side. Read the algebra proof, make sure you understand it, discuss it briefly with the person next to you. Slowly building up your ability to play groups. Going back to the same type of technology. Just keep seeing a little bit. I mean, I was going to say, yeah. You make all the X's minus. No, you have a huge proofing in there. So I have a huge proofing in there. The X's minus. The X's minus. Oh, are we good? Any questions? Any questions? All right. Have a read through this question. Oh my god, why did this That's not so true. Alright, watch me. Watch me. Are you familiar with the question? Yeah. Alright. So 6%. 6% solution we have at the moment. This is 6 over 100. Yeah. This is salt over total. So how much salt is in it over the total weight of the solution? Yeah. So what are we doing? Um, so we have 500 grams of, so of total solution. So 500 grams is our total solution. We need to adjust the numerator to match. What would that do? Six. No. 30 percent. Six. 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 Six.
30. Are we getting there? 30. So this is 30. So our function needs to increase the amount of salt by x. But when we increase the amount of salt, we increase the total as well. <coughs> if we increase the amount of salt, and then to make it stronger, we're going to increase the total as well. Okay. Ask yourself a couple of questions here about x for the domain. So, can x, first thing you should ask yourself about your x when you're making a rational function, or any function, is x integer or real? Can you have a half gram of salt? Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Ask yourself that question first, always. Um, because the other one, when you're talking about people, you have to say it was integer. So the other question on the test it was asking is it, you know, it was about people getting on a train or something like that. You can't have half a person. That one has to be integer. Now, can x be negative here? No, there's no way you can increase the, you can't take salt out like this. If you've got a bucket of solution, it's easy to get a spoon and put salt in. The process of getting salt out of the solution is much, much harder. The best way of getting salt out of the solution is adding water and throwing some solution away. That's how you would solve that problem. That's a different situation. So in this situation, you're adding salt. You can physically add salt, but you can't take it away. So that means that x is greater than or equal to zero, and x is real. That's our function defined. Well, now we have to make 20%. So what is 20% as a fraction in simplest form? 1 over 5. Let's rearrange this into 500 plus x is equal to 150 plus 5. What did I do there? Can you see? Why is it one over five is equal to twenty percent, and that's our goal. We're after a twenty percent solution. So we set the function equal to twenty percent. If we solve that, then it tell us the amount of salt. All right. So here, this one's looking good. Let's go across a little bit more. And we should get 4x is equal to how much? 350? A lot of people had trouble with this. So if we've got x is equal to 350 over 4, you're like, oh, fractions, I got some fractions. Okay. All right, I think for me, I would solve this by halving that. I get 175 over 2. Now I'm like, oh, I can't halve that one in my head so easily. So then just do your division algorithm. How many times does two go into one? It does. How many times does it go into seven? How many times does it go into 17? Oh, it's 17. Eight. What's the remainder? How many times does it go into 50? How many twos go into 50? Seven. What's the remainder? 15 or 15? 15. How many times does it go into 10? No. That seems pretty easy. That seems pretty easy when I do it. I think uh, the important thing that I, I, I think to think about a little bit is connecting to the reality of it. Math is not disconnected from reality, especially when it comes to the domain. Asking yourself questions like, can we have a half a person? Or 
and we have a negative value. Mm. Not sort of panicking, so not to figure this one out, but just sort of stepping back a little bit and seeing the big picture. What is this talking about? The trickier issue was basically setting up that the solution is defined as salt over total. Figuring that out, and then you should get all of it through. And, well, you have to figure out this. The 6% and the solution is salt divided by total. Pretty obvious, it's just a fraction describing a percentage. And then when you add salt, excuse me, you're also adding it to the total. Some people miss that, they just add it into the numerator. It doesn't work like that. You're adding grams to the total, you're adding grams of salt. All right, I think we're at IXL time. So we're going to do a um, Okay, stop talking, open up your computers, go to IXL Q1. So why did you guys do a million? It's a, a million, as in the word million, million gratitudes. Oh. Also, it, it looks really cool, cute. Oh, yeah, it looks cool. It's really cute. Yeah, it was so fun. They didn't know how to read this code. What's up? Like, it's actually a music. I think Mazda's a Yes. This is a Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, uh, we, 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 we,